Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to be here today. Um, I lead the Accenture Development Partnerships in ASEAN, and a very big welcome to Matt and to Simon, Simon from Second Muse and Matt from the Food Industry Asia. Um, before we start, I'd just like to briefly talk a little bit about what the global initiatives have done um, with regard to circular economy. So in the past few months, we've been having some focus sessions and some working groups. And we have three key findings. Um, the first one about circular economy is really about we need to broaden the definition of circular economy and the discussion around circular economy. And this is both in terms of what circular economy means and what kind of impact circular economy brings to the world. So traditionally, we see circular economy more as a um, end of the pipeline solution, more about recycling, and the impacts are more on the environment. But we feel that circular economy is a lot more than that. It's more about how we grow our economy in the future. It's about social inclusion. It has a big impact on job, um, job creation and also on partnerships. So that's why we say we feel that we need to broaden the discussion around circular economy. And secondly, we also think that um, to really accelerate circular economy, we need to find the right balance of carrot and stick. So we need regulations, and we have seen very good example from the European Union on the, um, on the circular economy directive, on the plastic strategy, and at the same time, we need to also find incentives to really um, attract businesses to do more in circular economy. And the last one is around creating a platform where we get everyone to participate in circular economy. And this is not just about businesses. Um, this is also about governments. It's about consumers and how we change consumer behavior, about all the NGOs that we have um, that are very active in circular economy. So today, we have these two great panelists, actually very, very innovative in the things they do. And I'm not going to introduce themselves. I'll let them introduce themselves. And um, Simon, could you please tell us about what you do and how it's related to circular economy? Yep, thanks, Ming Ming. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Simon Baldwin. I'm the director of Second Muse in Indonesia. Second Muse is a global innovation agency who works through collaboration. We work by bringing together major stakeholders from business, government, the private sector to focus our efforts on startups and innovators who are creating novel solutions to the world's complex problems. Our work, we're a B Corporation. Um, our work particularly focuses on uh, companies and innovators and startups and entrepreneurs who can tackle issues around social, environmental, and economic value creation. We do this across the full stack of the innovation um, process, if you will, depending on an evaluation of the ecosystem that we're wanting to work in. We try to understand whether that ecosystem requires hackathons, business incubators, ecosystem orchestration, um, or the potential to run our own investment fund to seed the development of these companies. Specifically, with regard to circular economy, um, we have had nine cohorts that we've incubated on topics like things such as green chemistry, uh, closing the loop, design and manufacturing, and the most, recent, um, the most recent cohort that's currently underway is a cohort that focuses on uh, customer engagement and new business models. Over that uh, period, we have uh, incubated over 110 companies that focus on circularity um, who have gone on to raise $240 million of capital. So you can see that our work is really incubating an ecosystem to go on and change the way businesses can work. But for us, our goal isn't about uh, businesses um, just alone. Our goal is about creating resilient communities and creating ecosystems in which we can test policy, we can engage in dialogue with uh, corporate partners, as well as stimulating entrepreneurs and innovators to, um, to bring new, new, new solutions to these problems. Um, since we're here to talk about solutions, maybe you can provide some examples of the businesses that you have incubated. I've, it was a difficult task picking three out of the hundred, and I'll just—I've I've picked three because they're quite diverse and different. 
Um, and because they're startups, they've also got interesting names. Um, so rather than Infinite Fiber Company, Infinite Did Fiber uh, Fiber Company, which is a company that has developed a process that is able to recycle cotton indefinitely. Um, so they're, they're working with the fashion industry to be able to close the loop around, uh, um, around materials for a process, as I said, that continually recycles indefinitely uh, the cotton material. Another really exciting um, company is called AgriProtein. AgriProtein have just been in the press recently for raising $100 million to expand their operation into the uh, African continent. And they're a, they're a fascinating company. They work by collecting uh, organic food scraps from hotels and hospitality areas, processing them with a black fly larva, and that process leads to organic fertilizer that can go to uh, the ag aquaculture, uh, agriculture sector, and then the black fly larva is processed into a high-protein food stock that can um, go in and, and feed particularly uh, aquaculture. The last one that I want to talk about is uh, bioselection. BioCell, C-E-L-L, selection. Um, they've developed a conversion technology that takes low-value, flexible plastic packaging and feeds that through a two-stage process into genetically engineered um, bacteria that's able to process raw materials that goes back into the manufacture of nylon. So they're just three examples across the circular economy spectrum of the types of companies that we're accelerating and incubating. Thank you very much, Simon. And talking about the food industry, Matt, could you share about your experience in circular economy with your members and your organization? So hello, everyone. Um, my name is Matt. I'm the executive director of Food Industry Asia. Um, we are a nonprofit, but we actually uh, represent 40 of the biggest food and beverage companies in the world, multinationals and Asian corporates. Um, uh, the work that we do uh, is collectively on, on behalf of industry. We try and play a role of honest broker, although we don't pretend to be a neutral platform. We do represent industry. Uh, and we, we work across areas such as health and nutrition, uh, food safety, trade-related uh, issues, as well as um, sustainable packaging. And I think I don't have too much time to talk about all the work that we do across those four <coughs> pillars, so I'll just focus on uh, perhaps sustainable packaging. Um, we're, we're focused on, um, on engaging and, and advocating um, and, and trying to collaborate with policymakers across the region, so uh, in particular in markets like Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, um, and Thailand as well on, on the uh, specifics of, of sustainable packaging a little bit in India as well. Um, and what we, we found is that there's been a lot of talk and knee-jerk reactions of, of talking about bans on plastics and, and, and taxes and, and such like, but um, there hasn't really been a, an evidence-based fact or a fact base on, on what some of the policy levers are um, and, and what the potential impact could be. So uh, we, we commissioned a, a piece of uh, research by Alpha Beta, a sustainability consultancy. Um, to look at what some of the potential policy levers um, could be incorporated across some of those markets. Um, we came up with sort of like 31, and we've done a, quite a wide consultation with uh, not just industry, but obviously with government and NGOs and others as well. Uh, and we found that sort of out of, those, um, out of those 31, the top 15 of those can represent uh, or could have actually 90% impact or represent 90% of the impact of reducing marine and ocean waste. And we're, we're trying to use this piece of evidence uh, and this policy document is an informed discussion um, and, and create sort of a, a, a platform um, where we can all sort of collaborate as well. Uh, I hadn't actually heard a second muse um, until today, so I'm meeting Simon. So it's quite interesting the work he's doing with startups and how we might be able to leverage some of those in the circular economy with some of the multinationals too. So that's, that's uh, just uh, in a nutshell what, we, what we're doing. Thank you very much. And we were talking a little bit about incentives, about carrots and sticks. Um, so Simon, I, I know recently there was a big event for you um, about the incubator network. Perhaps you could share a little bit on that? Yeah, really quickly. This is going to be a conversation that we're taking through to the panels this afternoon um, and again in, uh, tomorrow in the circular economy panel. So I won't dwell too deeply on it. But the incubator network is uh, going to be um, funded in partnership with the Ocean Conservancy and Circulate Capital an investment fund out of New York that has raised a $100 million fund to invest in startups and innovative solutions to waste and recycling. The goal is that by investing in um, the front end of land-based waste and recycling, waste management, we are able to, as Matt said, prevent a significant amount of ocean leaking, uh, of plastic leaking into the ocean. Um, the incubator network will be a, a network of business incubators that are locally 
uh, specific to the areas in which they're working in. And Second Muse will sit on top, on top of that network and provide the technical assistance and the funding to run those uh, incubators in each of the local areas and convene at a regional level. So as I said, this is something that I'm really keen to take into the conversations in the working groups this afternoon and see how we can together um, ideate on that as a potential solution by creating this ecosystem of partners, a platform of partners to be able to tackle um, this particular small part of the circular economy challenge that we face. Thank you. Um, Sorry, uh, maybe as well, how, how we look at some of those on uncommon collaborations, because uh, I think together with FIA, with the Economic Development Board and some of the big food brands, we set up or established a uh, material circular lab in Singapore. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's primarily um, working with big multinationals and the government. But it's how we can find some uncommon collaborations with other sectors or other industries, and perhaps we'll take that to the panel um, this afternoon to try and broaden that, right. that, that initiative as well. Absolutely. And also, Matt, because you, you represent some of the biggest companies in the food industry, and perhaps you could share a little bit more about what are some of the drivers for these big businesses to participate and to transition to circular economy? Yeah, obviously, um, things, as I mentioned, bans on plastics that certainly capture the attention of companies. <laughs> um, I think another one as well is, I'll take Singapore as a con in, a, in context, it's not just about the multinationals, it's about SMEs as well. How do we bring the... the a significant volume and amount of SMEs on board with this as well. Um, so in Singapore, where by 2020 they're going to introduce mandatory reporting of the use and of plastics and how much in, uh, plastics are being used or sold in the marketplace by, by companies. Um, and that's sort of a, a stepping stone to bring not just multinationals, obviously, but SMEs on board with this process with a potential to, to, to look at EPR. I think uh, from our, our, our perspective and from the, from the food companies, you know, they're not necessarily resistant to EPR because extended producer responsibility that exists in Europe already. But I think um, we have to look at the, to how that operates or how that's implemented in some of the individual markets and the idiosyncrasies of those markets as well, and perhaps looking at extended stakeholder responsibility too. Um, although I know that with big multinationals, they tend to be targeted and, and they're the ones that are first movers. But it's important to have a sort of a general consultation about how we can get more of the supply chain on board with that as well. well any of those, those are going to be some of the drivers. I think another one as well is potentially incentives. Um, not necessarily for the multinationals, but certainly for SMEs. Um, and again, I might take a, a Singapore context. Um, they do a lot of work by giving grants in areas of health and nutrition on reformulating food products. Um, this is under the Health Pr um, Promotion Board, which is under the Ministry of Health. And that's giving up to about half a million dollars to um, SMEs um, to reformulate their food products, not just strip out sugar, salt, and fat, um, but look at what uh, additional product, um, uh, proteins or fibers they can put into food products. Um, and, and you know they've been quite imaginative how they can get those companies on board. I don't see why we couldn't look at that from a you know from a packaging perspective, um, and if that could be applied to. Although I don't want to pick on anyone who's from the Singapore government here, but, but that, that's something that we can discuss. Yeah, thank you very much, both. Um, I think we can all look forward to a very interesting circular economy panel this afternoon. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> okay,